was in Malta that the Duke of Edinburgh assumed command of the frigate HMS Magpie. Prince Philip, now a lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy, took up a post in Malta. The princess stayed with him there for extended periods, and they were briefly able to enjoy life almost like any other young married couple, visiting the local shops, dining with friends, and going out dancing. But I think that was probably the nearest time to a, a sort of relaxed, rather normal life that um, certainly the princess experienced. Being a naval wife, I think something she really did enjoy and value and was probably quite helpful for her. All too soon, royal duties were to intrude. Then came their royal highnesses, setting out on the great tour of Australia and New Zealand. They're taking the places of the king and queen who would have gone but for his majesty's illness. Their first stop was Kenya. While there, a report claimed that the king had died. Philip took Elizabeth out and kept the news from her until it could be confirmed. Later that day, he had to tell her that her father was dead. I should think devastating. Because, I mean, from the moment the Queen stepped down those steps, I can see that picture, can't you see her now coming down those steps? That was it. If her foot touched the ground, that was it. The princess had come home as Queen. Everything was to change for Prince Philip, too. I think one of the worst things that, that happened to him was the very early death of the King because he had a very good career, he was mapping it out for himself, he had seen his uncle heading towards the top of the Navy, and he was at that stage of his life, head of his family, Prince Charles, Princess Anne were already born. In a sense, all that is over, and he then has to take on a supporting role to the Queen. How difficult was it to relinquish it when the Queen acceded to the throne? Well, <clears throat> I mean, how long is a piece of string? I don't know how, how difficult it was. It, was it I difficult? Was, well, I, it was naturally disappointing because I'd just been promoted to commander. And, and in fact, the, the most interesting part of the naval career was just starting. But then equally, if I stopped and thought about it, well, um, the, the, the uh, being married to the Queen, it seemed to me that my first duty was to to serve her in the best way I could. The peers of the realm, including Prince Philip, are already in their places. I remember idiotic things about the coronation and getting, you know, dressed up before breakfast in all one's finery, which was very rather extraordinary. Some of the peers kept sandwiches in their coronets so that, you know, because of course you couldn't see what was under the top of the coronet and when there was an interval and nothing was happening, the coronets would be taken off and the sandwiches would be eaten. First up, her husband, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. I, Philip, will become your lead man of life and will. And so, rising, touches the crown upon her head. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth... As consort, from this day forward, Prince Philip's primary role became one of supporting and serving the Queen. There are no hard and fast rules about a consort's role. Prince Albert had a desk beside Queen Victoria and helped her with affairs of state. But Winston Churchill and the old guard at the palace discouraged the young Queen from following this example leaving Prince Philip to carve out a role for himself. He has measured out his life in handshakes. Yes, he has been the leader of 847 different organizations, going from regiments to small charities, from design groups to people involved in sport, from things involving disability to the World Wide Fund for Nature, a vast array of material, from literally clocks to bicycles. Naturally, a lot of excitement when Prince Philip, as patron of the London Federation of Boys Clubs, went on a round of visits. He went to South Not Korea. only did Prince Philip lend his name and effort to existing organisations, he soon initiated some of his own. What 
was the genesis? What made you want to create the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme? <laughs> I didn't want to create it. Um, it was uh, Kurt Hahn came along one day and he sent for me. And I went to see him at Brown's Hotel, which he always used to say. He said, my boy, I want you to start an award scheme. <laughs> I said, thanks very much. <laughs> and because we had a, 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 a badge scheme at Gordonston, if you qualified in one throwing, one running and one jumping, you got a sort of badge thing. And I said, well, look, I can't start it, but if you put together some a committee of the great and the good, I'm perfectly happy to chair it, which is what happened. Now in its 55th year, the award embodies the twin beliefs that underpinned Gordonston, the value of physical activity and service to the community. I think the reason it's, it's stuck is that there are new generations every year who are confronted by a completely strange world and, and very little opportunity to find out what it's all about. So if you can give them a sort of temp or sort of, I don't know, template or whatever, you know, to which they can discover what, what, what life's life. And that's, it's, it's always relevant because there's always a new generation coming up for it. London's South Bank exhibition is ready to show the world what Britain can do. We've done wonders since the war. Now we're blowing our own trumpet for a change. One enduring focus of Prince Philip's interest has been in the area of design. I suppose it all started at the Festival of Britain. <laughs> Uh, when, when, when I got involved with that and, and suddenly it had my eyes open to the way th people did things and designed things and the, or the sort of concept of... of uh, but that time, 1951, Festival of Britain, you recall that as being a moment when... Well, I think that's when I got, in, I got involved with people like Stephen Gooden and, and Hugh Casson and, and, and they were all very... I mean, it was, it, was, it was heady stuff as far as I was concerned because, I mean, while I was in the Navy, I didn't meet people like that. Prince Philip soon found an opportunity to put his interest in design into practice, a new royal yacht. I name the ship Britannia. I wish success to her and to all who sail in her. <laughs> Oddly enough, the, the first involvement was with the, the general sort of design of the ship because the chap in the Admiralty was given the task of designing it. This chap was a civil servant who really didn't know. And whereas I'd been at sea and I think I knew about ships and what happened. The Prince engaged the services of designer Hugh Casson and worked with him to create a vessel which became both an ambassador for Britain and the royal family's home away from home. It's a room which can be converted into a cinema, and this is where films are projected. Well, state room, the keynote is Having somewhere like the Royal Yachts to leave your baggage, to have your office, to be able to do so much of your entertaining, took an enormous amount of pressure off my parents. Was as children, it was a joy, painfully. I don't ever remember being ill on board, but I must have been, because it seems likely. Certainly remember the efforts put in by the sailors who were there to look after us. So each of us had a sort of sailor attendant stop us either flinging ourselves overboard or getting lost. It seemed to work quite well. They were very good at it. How important was fatherhood to you compared with being the Queen's consort? Was it something well, you were conscious of, a role you were conscious of fulfilling? No. Well, I, I mean, no. I just, I was a father. Mm -hmm. Are you a father? I am. Well, do you think about it in philosophical I terms? I worried a lot about the prospect of it when the children were coming well, along. Well, yes, so did I, but uh, and you worry about the children themselves. But uh, yeah. you had a sort of routine, yes. I mean, during the day, we'd always see them at the same time. And then we always made sure that we were at home, either here or at Balmoral or Sandringham during the holidays. <laughs> As a family, um, it's rather surprisingly here, my children say that they thought I was a, had been quite a good mother, and I think I would say that that was spades to my father. He set an, an extraordinary example. He put some work into it. He made efforts to be there, and particularly, I think, on a regular basis at bedtime. At that degree of continuity, when you're not going to be around all the time, that there are some periods when you need to have continuity. And that was one of them, and that was one which could make, make a real impact. I mean, bedtime stories are things that, you know, children probably don't get so much nowadays, but it was very important in my day. 
And again, it was still a period when families made their own play. So you did everything together, and if that was chasing games or card games, and they both partook. And they were both very quick, I have seen to remember from the chasing games. Well, it's not much use for anything here today. Oh, I fit on there. Here we go. I love it. <laughs> I once asked him about his relationship with Prince Charles. I said, it's interesting that, you know, you seem so similar in many ways. You know, you walk the same way, you talk the same way, you share interests in young people, in conservation, in the arts. And yet, I feel that maybe you don't get on as well as you might. And he interrupted me before I got to that, and he said, oh, but there is a difference. And the difference is this. Prince Charles is a romantic, and I'm a pragmatist. And sometimes a romantic thinks that a pragmatist is unfeeling. That's the way it is. Towards the end of 1956, the Duke took Britannia on a tour of the Commonwealth and the Antarctic. His three-month absence gave rise to media speculation that all was not well in the royal marriage. He then is actually sent out to go on a, a mission to test Britannia, take it to parts of the Commonwealth that had been never visited by a senior royal before, and he goes on this expedition, and then the press say, oh, he's abandoned the Queen. What's wrong with their marriage? You know, I think his despairing about the British press began in the 1950s with that. The Queen took the unusual step of defending her husband's absence in her Christmas broadcast. If my husband cannot be at home on Christmas Day, I could not wish for a better reason than that he should be traveling in other parts of the Commonwealth. And he has been to places that I have never seen. Do you read about yourself in the press? Not if I can help it, no. Do you think you are misrepresented by your sense of humor no, or not, your attitude not, to not, life? No, not <laughs> consistently. Occasionally, yes. Far from the eyes of the world's press, the artist Edward Sego joined the Duke on his tour of the Antarctic. Sego, I know, gave you a lot of instruction on painting. Was that when it began on the Royal Yacht? No, it began here, but in, in, and not by Sego. And Sego couldn't instruct anybody. He, I had to say, well, how do you do it? <laughs> and he said, well, you do it like this. It's exactly like asking a... A country. How do you get the rabbit out of a hat? He said, you must take it out of the hat. Said, How do you do it? You do it like this. And so you had to sit there and watch and see whether you could derive anything. Well, he was very useful in, in other respects, for instance, in what colours to put on your palette, what, how to prepare your board, and how to, you know, all sorts of little practical things were very, very helpful. It, it's curious. I mean, um, I'm a very bad judge of the pictures because I judge them on the basis of whether I enjoyed painting them or not. But when you show them to other people, they'll pick kind of something else and say, well, I like that. And I think, well, how could you like that? I nearly killed me trying to do that one. Why don't you try this one? I love doing that. <laughs> After 43 years' service, the Royal Yacht Britannia was decommissioned in 1997. She hasn't been replaced. What were your feelings when the Royal Yacht was decommissioned? Sad. <laughs> do you think it was the right thing to do? No. <laughs> what do you think should have happened? I mean, what you ought to have had is it simply had those steam turbines taken out and diesel engines put in, it would take half the amount of... So she was as sound as a bell, and she would have gone on for another 50 years. As consort, Prince Philip has had responsibility for running the Queen's private estates at Balmoral and Sandringham. His attention to detail extends into unexpected areas. This is the picnic trailer, um, built in 1994. The Duke member always asks for, it's got to be practical, uh, it must not rattle or be noisy, and it's got to be efficient for when he uses it. Very naval, this is, isn't it? Oh, look at this. All oh, his... this is every boy's dream. This is all the, his own spice tracks. Wicker baskets, drinking racks. So how much of this, Danny, is you and how much is the Duke? Um, there's always a bit of a competition with the Dick Red and myself. Who comes up with the best idea? Everything has its own little slot, little place. 
Well, I was really stuck for doing one engineering project. And uh, he came in one evening, he said, uh, have you thought of anything? I said, no, I just can't. I said, I'm going to have to think about that in the bath, sir. He came back the next morning, looking quite pleased with himself, got out of the Land Rover, came in the workshop. Danny. Yes, Your Highness. I know how to do it. So he said, what do you think of that? Well, I said, I don't really know. I said, uh, I said it'd be a good idea if that was my idea, though. <laughs> <laughs> what made you want to design a barbecue? Well, I went to the Olympic Games in, <clears throat> in Helsinki in 1952. And the, the um, Canadian ambassador invited me to a barbecue. I'd never even heard of the things. And, and he had this sort of open fire with a grill, threw lumps of meat on it. And I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> I came went back to Balmoral and got one of these fire grills and put it over some bricks and things. And, and did some steak on it. Everybody seemed to think it was all right. So it sort of progressed from there. Danny mentioned to you that Duke Edinburgh has barbecues, and this is one of his spots where he would barbecue. And all the equipment that's on top of the picnic trailer would be brought out here. What does he cook? Well, mainly game that's shot on the estate. Venison, pheasant, partridge, woodcock, teal. So very self-sustaining, then. Really. Absolutely. Not a burger or a kebab in sight. Not at all. Occasionally a sausage. <laughs> Since giving up polo in the early 1970s, <laughs> carriage driving has been the Duke's sporting passion. At 90, he no longer competes, but he still drives whenever he can. Prince Philip holds the reins of the world's most famous family firmly in his hands and has had to steer them through sometimes difficult obstacles. None more so than those encountered in the Queen's infamous Annus Horribilis. is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. A terrible fire at Windsor Castle destroyed more than 100 rooms and caused almost 40 million pounds worth of damage. This room wasn't involved. The fire stopped at the halfway through that room. No, the, the, so this is the so the, the fire then got as far Stop as halfway, halfway over across. There. Yeah. Prince Philip spearheaded the restoration and took action to raise the money needed. So we opened Buckingham Palace to raise the money and, and, and also reorganised collecting money here. Oh, sorry, just, uh, oh Lord, is that locked too? Yeah, I'll, I'll unlock You've it. locked us yeah. into yeah. this place. Yeah. Well, we want to go back the other way. Where was that? <laughs> and I think this is where the fire started, of the of the old chapel, and the chapel was that's the door into the St George's Hall. The fire exposed previous alterations to the castle, so Prince Philip was able to restore some areas to their medieval state and to make improvements of his own. And so I found that we, we could create this because there was this space here by moving the chapel over there. So you got this entrance to the to the St George's Hall, which I thought was an improvement. Well, I see, I'll, I'll open it up and I'll get that closed off. Yeah. This private chapel isn't open to the public. The, the thing is that the, the architectural structure allowed for this to be moved to this position. Then there was a little passageway through here. And, and I discovered, noticed this goes, is over a door. And I thought if we could fit this into this section, we could make that into an octagon. Yeah, yeah. We thought we'd put in a, a window. So I thought, well, why not have the fire? The bottom part is you know, a sort of tribute to the firefighters. And these are the people uh, you know, rescuing all the pictures. And the, 
And I thought it'd be fun to put smoke sort of turning into trees with a tassel emerging at the top. At the time of the fire, another royal crisis was brewing. Prince Charles and Princess Diana's marriage was in trouble. There was a time with the Princess of Wales when he was accused of having written a letter in which he, he was meant to have said that she was a harlot, something like this. So I was asked to come into Buckingham Palace and read the correspondence between Prince Philip and the Princess of Wales. And I hope one day that that correspondence will be published in full because it was extremely moving and interesting on both sides and he made a very determined effort to find any way that he could keep that marriage going. He shared with her quite a lot of his own experiences of what it was like marrying into the family and how he too understood what she was going through to some extent. I don't think many other members of the family would have done the same thing. While not officially involved in matters of state, it's clear that Prince Philip has played a key role behind the scenes as the longest serving consort in the history of the British monarchy. All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. Frequently, we have discussed my intended speech beforehand. And as you will imagine, his views have been expressed in a forthright manner. <laughs> he is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family and this and many other countries owe him a debt grat greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. I suppose for all of us, as we evolved as individuals and started to do our own things, then there are certain constraints of um, this existence and particularly his and being closer to the monarch which we all found more difficult to manage and wanted to do things our own way. And that's when you begin to appreciate just how, how difficult it must have been. And particularly if you're somebody with so many ideas, you know, like the idea of change. This is not a life which is designed to do much of that and certainly not very rapidly. Members of the royal family now, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, Princess Margaret on the right. Some of the royal family's most private moments have had to be played out in public, and the Duke is the man behind the throne, offering guidance to its younger members. Well, as I know, there's a very good relationship between Prince William and his grandparents. Of course, there's the time when the Princess of Wales was killed. Um, at one point, Prince William wasn't terribly keen to walk in the funeral procession, and indeed the night before, I think, hadn't entirely made up his mind whether he was going to do that or not because he thought that the whole thing was sort of media shenanigans. And Prince Philip said to him, I think that when you're older, you would very much regret not walking behind your mother's coffin and I'll walk with you. And there's also a moment during the funeral procession when they go under Whitehall, when they presumably think the cameras aren't on them and you see Prince Philip sort of tap him on the shoulders if to say, how's it going, you know? To my mind, that's all you ever need to know about Prince Philip. It has been an, an, a unique position, the one that you found yourself well, in. Well, there have been several people, previous ones. I mean, there was the Prince Albert and Prince George. <laughs> when you look back at it, is there anything you would have done differently? That's hypothetical. <laughs> but interesting. Well, yes, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not have made mis mistakes that I did make, yes. Yeah. No, I'm not going to tell you what they are. <laughs> <laughs> At 90 and 25 years past the official age of retirement, Prince Philip is finally relinquishing a few of his duties. But it's certain he'll never renounce the vow he made to his queen almost 60 years ago to be her liege man of life and limb.